Since 1984, Sawyer has existed to support your wildest adventures. Learn about their advanced insect repellents and family of technical lightweight water filters at Sawyer.com. Welcome to Wellness in the Wilderness. Come with us on the trail of life as we inspire you to take a step outdoors to disconnect from the distractions and reconnect with yourself. Sydney Williams and her guests will motivate you to get active and get well. Now, here is Sydney. All right, everybody, welcome to Wellness in the Wilderness. I'm your host, Sydney Williams, author and founder of Hiking My Feelings. And today I'm broadcasting live from Pimu, aka Catalina Island which is the ancestral lands of the Tongva people, now known as Avalon, California. Last week, I said it was going to be just me, but I didn't want to be alone. I want someone to hold my hand because this is a big announcement and we're pretty excited about it. So today, I have my husband, co-founder of Hiking My Feelings, outdoor man extraordinaire, and one of my favorite humans on this, meh, my favorite human on this planet, and my best friend, Mr. Barry Williams. So from the White Mountains of New Hampshire to the rugged backcountry of Catalina Island and everything in between, Barry Williams has been an outdoorist and educator in a professional capacity for the past 25 years. Between his career as a professional skydiver, wilderness EMT, and now co-founder of Hiking My Feelings, the essence of Barry's facilitation style is that of trust, patience, and the gift of belief. In this episode, we'll be chatting about Barry's intrinsic connection to nature, how hiking helped him get back to doing the things he loves following hip surgery, and how every adventure he's been on has prepared him for the one we're about to embark on here on Catalina Island. Welcome to the show, Barry. Are you ready for a great day? Oh boy, am I. <laughs> well, isn't this something? It is something. What do you think? How are you feeling? <laughs> well, I'm usually watching this or actually listening to this from a distance to let you kind of do your thing in 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 peace. So it's it's interesting to actually watch you work your magic here. So hopefully I uh I uh do all right here. I think you're going to be just fine. It's a conversation <laughs> amongst friends. And for anybody listening on this episode in particular, we welcome your calls, whether you've known Barry from his wee days in New England or his days as a skydiver or now at Hiking My Feelings and you want to just say, hey, see what's up. We'd love to hear from you. So Barry, let's start at the beginning. You've said it as long as I've known you that we aren't separate from nature. We're part of it. I know you didn't come up with that quote, and I know that that's ancestral knowledge that's been passed down for generations since time immemorial. But I know this is especially for, true for you growing up in New Hampshire. So to kick us off, tell me a little bit about your experiences growing up in the outdoors in New England and how they have shaped the life you're living today. Well, I think one of my favorite quotes comes from Alan Watts, where he says that we're we're no separate from nature as a wave is from the ocean. And if you think about it, you know, we're just kind of all recycled bits and pieces that kind of go through. So um, I think I in my personal opinion is that the more disconnected we are from nature, the more dis-ease that we have. And and it just kind of creates chaos in our lives. So uh, getting back to nature from where I started up in New Hampshire is really uh, it's been healthy for me and it's been healthy, obviously, for you. But I, I grew up on the seacoast of New Hampshire, which was a great spot. It was uh, Dover, New Hampshire. So it was about, I don't know, about 30 minutes from the ocean, maybe about 45 minutes from the lakes region, uh, maybe about an hour into the into the mountains, an hour and a half into the White Mountains. And And when I look back on it in today's world, the stuff that I did as a kid, my parents, if I would have grown up today, my parents would probably be in jail for like neglect. <laughs> it's funny. I feel like everybody kind of talks about that. Like I think about how I used to go out and we just, we had a literal dinner bell and like come home before the street lights come on. But you, you, on the other hand, you had this big forest behind your house and your dad set you up on kind of like wayfinding expeditions and stuff like that. So tell me a little bit about the stuff that you did as a kid that would now have uh poor Howard and Lydia arrested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I was, we were fortunate enough to have like, nice piece of property with a river behind us and like all these hiking trails that would go out into like into really nowhere. Cause at, at that time in Dover, what, that area wasn't really as developed as it is today. So I would go out and I would be miles out in the wilderness completely by myself or with my kids or with my kid friends, you know, just out there doing whatever we did. But like, man, I like, I think about if I was an adult and I was, six miles out in the wilderness and I just saw a random child running around (laughs) like who's looking out after you you know like 
who, who who's your parents and who do I need to call here? So, um, yeah. So one of the things my, my dad used to do, I mean, I grew up skiing and just kind of hiking and camping and we'd do canoe camping, uh, down the Saco river with my folks. We do that every summer. Um, but one of the things my dad used to do is all these hiking trails that looped around the river behind our house. We'd, um, he'd do like orienteering, uh, kind of courses. And it wasn't like a race cause we didn't really have anybody to like compete with. It wasn't, it was just for the fun of doing it. So if you aren't familiar with orienteering, it's like, you have a map, you have a compass and they just kind of draw all these things. It's almost like a, a treasure hunting expedition. So, you know, you go to to the one point and then that would have your clues to the next point. It's kind of like that amazing race show yeah. um, on TV. Um, so, you know, I just grew up running around, getting dirty, you know, <laughs> doing stupid stuff, you know, by the river and, you know, not, you know, trying to get lost. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, before we uh, set up the description for this episode, yesterday in our Wellness in the Wilderness newsletter, I had picked this picture of George the bison, who's a bison that lives on Catalina, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about him later. But I was trying to figure out this like metaphor between the picture of the bison and how when we look at a picture, especially this picture, there's it's this bison that's like coming up to the crest of a hill. And how if we looked at it in like one point in time, we'd be like, oh, look, he's so close to the top. And we might not ever think about it again. And when I was trying to explain what I was trying to like wrap my head around last night, you're like, so I'm the bison. Uh, so the bison that we're talking about, his name is George. He's a local legend. Uh, he lives on the ridge. By, According to the, the lady at the donut shop. Right. So a local legend to one person. Um, and we've just kind of run with it. But George uh, has a gimpy leg. And I think maybe that's why you identified yourself as the bison. If we're making a comparison between George the bison and Barry the human for this episode and how you found healing in nature. Talk to me a little bit about growing up in, uh, in the like Perthes disease and how that kind of led to your hip replacement. Yeah. So uh, for the listeners, I'm sure you've seen Forrest Gump, right? So I don't know if Forrest Gump had the same disease I had when I was a kid, but essentially it was the same thing. Um, I think I was in nursery school or kindergarten. One of those, you know, really formative years where um, I remember one day, like my, my parents were like, why are you limping? And I was like, I'm not limping. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, you're limping. And uh, so they, they brought me in to get checked out by a doctor. And it turns out I had, I had leg Perthes disease. And I've only ever met one other person in my life to actually have it. But essentially what it, it looks like, it looked like, um, what Forrest Gump had, like he had braces on his legs and stuff. So for me, what they did is they actually put me in, in traction when I was in nursery school or kindergarten for like six months Oof. down in Boston, not New Hampshire, in Boston. So I was like, you know, it was kind of by myself and, you know, my parents would come down and visit, but like, you know, traveling an hour and a half, you know, especially with Boston traffic, you know, they probably weren't able to get down as much. Um, so it was a, it was kind of a formative time in my life, but to have your legs just kind of like propped up and essentially what happens with this disease is for, and they don't know what causes it, but essentially it's the, the ball of the femur doesn't get uh, enough blood circulation. So what happens is the femur itself um, becomes soft. So instead of a, a round ball, mine actually turned into a mushroom. <laughs> so, so it really kind of softened it up. So, you know, one leg was shorter than the other. So what they did is they put me in traction to, you know, allow the, the, the hip bone to actually, um, you know, try and grow properly without all that pressure on it. So after six months of that, um, they put me in leg braces for several years. So I was that kid in school. Aww. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I was I was still I think I was third grade champion of the obstacle course. I had the record. Yeah, you at, did. At Woodman Park School in Dover, New Hampshire. I had the record. I don't know if it still stands, but I did it with leg braces on. So, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll never forget, actually. Um I think uh, when they actually took the braces off, um, the doctor was like, I'll never forget. It. He's like, uh, you'll be walking with a cane by the time you're 25. 
And were you? No, <laughs> no. I think at 25, I was jumping out of planes. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think I actually made it to 32 before my hip gave out. And really what, what, it, what happened was, um, I was doing a lot of like, uh, work at the drop zone. I was like chainsawing a bunch of brush down in the fall, just to kind of clear things up. And it was just the, the repetitive bending down and squatting down to, you know, use a chainsaw, um, tore a quarter size chunk of cartilage out of my hip. Oof. Yeah. So I was bone on bone and like housebound for a while and like taking, uh, they had me on fentanyl patches and Percocet and Vicodin. I couldn't really walk up the stairs. I couldn't sit in the car for longer than 15 minutes without like, you know, popping Vicodin or Percocet on top of the uh, fentanyl, like they were Pez, you know? So Yeah. That's that's the hip. Yeah. So you are in all this pain. They've got you loaded up on these meds. And talk to me about the surgery that you had and the status of that surgery at the time. Well, it was interesting. I, I went and saw, I think, three or four doctors. One of them was the doctor from the Celtics. Um, and um, none of them wanted to operate on me. Why was that? Uh, because I had CAT scans, bone scans, MRIs, x-rays, all sorts of stuff. It didn't show that quarter-sized chunk of cartilage missing. So they were like, there's no medical reason for us to actually give you this. Because you were how old? Uh, uh, 20, like, uh, uh, 30 yeah, 32? Like early 30s? Yeah, early yeah. 30s. So not like fall down, break a hip the general thing that gets you into that kind of surgery, like the, the clear cut things for like elderly folks. Right. Yeah, you're, no. you're 30 something. And they're like, get back. Well, they knew I had this disease and they, you know, they figured something was going on, but I mean, I was getting steroid shots into my hip. I mean, this was a problem. Like I, I couldn't work. I was housebound. Yeah. Um. So I ended up finding a doctor <laughs> down in uh, Myrtle beach, somewhere near there. And, uh, He's like, there's no medical reason for us to give you this. And I was like, all right. And well, the, the surgery that he was able to do was at the time it was experimental. It's a hip uh, resurfacing where essentially they just take the ball, they core it into a cylinder, put a new cap on it, and then put a new socket in my hip. Instead of like. Instead okay. of a traditional hip implant where they chop off the top of your femur, shove a rod down in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know. It's a little more gentle. Yeah. And it was actually geared towards younger people like me. Um, and the great thing was about it and still to this day is there, there's no res restrictions once you have the surgery, because with a traditional hip implant, you're not supposed to carry over X amount of weight because um, it's much easier to dislocate. And so they want to conserve as much bone as possible. So later on down the road, if I do need to get another hip replacement, they can go in and do a traditional one. So. Um, yeah, he was like, well, I mean, I, I had a tentative appointment to get a traditional hip implant, which I didn't really want to do, but he's like, uh, he's like, I, I, I don't want to give you this surgery. And I was like, well, all right, well, I need to do something cause I can't live like this. So I guess I'm just going to get a traditional hip implant. He's like, well, hold on. We got an opening on like Tuesday. Can you fly down here? <laughs> and I was like, Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I got down there and they, they did all their, uh, you know, their, the pre-screening and stuff. And they're like, oh, my God, I really wish you would have told me that uh, you would have been on fentanyl and all these other painkillers. He's like, you're going to have DTs. What is DTs? Delirium tremens. Oh. Like severe withdrawals. Oh, my. Like, you know, where you start seeing stuff and like, you know, bugs are crawling out of your skin. And, right. and you, know, you got the shakes and the tremors. And turns out that, you know, I, I had that surgery and I woke up. I remember it was like, I looked at the clock as, as soon as I woke up and it was, it was 420 in the afternoon. And I was like, well, this is a, all right. Because I'm still kind of doped up from the, the surgery, but I was like, the pain was gone. And I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah. So uh, after that, long story short, um, because it was down in uh, Myrtle Beach, um, they had me, uh, in the, um, in the hospital and then they, you know, had me up and walking and going upstairs like hours after the surgery. And then I think they kept me overnight 
for one night just to make sure, you know, no blood clots or anything like that. And then they had me stay in the hotel across the street just to, for the next night to make sure everything's cool. And then they put me on a plane. Wow. And they said, go. <laughs> go forth, young man. No, I mean, they, they did not give me any, like, I did not have a physical therapist or nothing. And so when, after the surgery, the doctor was like, oh, holy cow. Because all the things that didn't come up on the CAT scan, oh, yeah. that missing piece of cartilage. Like, yeah. what do they have to say about that? Yeah, well, he walked into the room. I was like, how'd it look in there? And he's like, you must have been in excruciating pain. I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> I mean, because I'll tell you, man, like I, they were putting like six inch needles directly into my hip socket, like into my groin. Oh, my God. You know, and like, I'm not doing this for fun. I'm not like a, a you know, a pill seeker or anything like that. You know, it, right. it's like this was like, you know, the cure was kind of worse than what I was dealing with, but. It was, it was pretty gnarly, Yeah. but he was like, Hey, you must've been, you were on bone on bone. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that can relate or something like that. But it, like, it was just, it was absolute nightmare. Yeah. Well, and to that effect, like the drugs you listed off you, if you were a different person or if this was a different time, or if you weren't in as much pain as you were in, that could have been like a very easily could have trans transitioned into like an opiate addiction, right? Like they had you on everything. But because it was so, you were in so much pain. Like I, the thing I'm thinking of is like when you had your neck surgery and you were in so much pain and they were like, oh, wow, this, like, this is shocking. And it's like, well, is it? Cause like, I, I, I said I was in pain. Like I'm not lying. Mm -hmm. So was it like validating to hear that from the doctor and just be like, yeah, everything I said I was feeling <laughs> now it's been medically recognized. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't really, uh, hold them at fault for any of it. Cause it did the, the all the tests didn't show it. So right. it is what it is. But like, I, I'm, I don't think of myself as somebody who wants to have major surgery for the fun for the of drugs. It. <laughs> yeah. That's a long play. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I had like for the, you know, he's like, you can have withdrawals and stuff. And I was like, well, uh, I think after the surgery, I think I had one Percocet. Yeah. And then that was it. Like I didn't have any withdrawals. I didn't have any cravings. I didn't have anything like that because, you know, if you're, if you're in the medical field um, and I worked as an EMT, so I kind of can speak on it, I think is, you know, if, if you actually need these drugs, you know, because it never got me high. It just, right. it made me, so I was able to walk up the stairs. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, it just, it wasn't something that I was dependent upon, but it, it was, because uh, it almost took me two years to get that surgery. So it was two years of, you know, being housebound. Wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, as part of this whole thing, um, as we get ready for this next break, one of the roles that Barry has held in his career in education and the outdoors was as a skydiving instructor. And he were a professional skydiver for 17 years, um, 16, 17 years. And as part of that, you were also a safety and training advisor for the United States Parachute Association. So when we get back, we're going to talk about very safety mindset, kind of tapping back into that early exposure um, as a child being feral in the woods uh, with the Williams clan, and then going into how that translates to what we do today at Hiking My Feelings. So don't go away. We'll be right back. And when we do come back, give us a call. Shout out Barry. Say hey. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Barry Williams. Mm -hmm. Have you ever spoken unkindly to yourself? Do you realize when you do? Are you ready to make changes, but find yourself completely paralyzed by the choices in front of you? We live in a hyper-connected, always-on world, and frankly, it's exhausting. Let's make time to disconnect from the distractions and reconnect with yourself. Hiking My Feelings exists to help people discover the healing power of nature. Kickstart your healing journey and grab a copy of the book that started our movement, Hiking My Feelings, Stepping into the Healing Power of Nature, named one of Audible's best hiking audiobooks and available wherever books are sold. Visit hikingmyfeelings.org today to learn more. Sawyer is more than an outdoor company. Every Sawyer product you buy contributes to our common humanity. 
bringing Sawyer water filtration systems to people in need all around the world. In just 2022 alone, 260,000 households in over 45 countries received clean drinking water through Sawyer filters. Over the past 10 years, we've teamed up with over 140 charities in 80 countries to provide long-term, sustainable relief domestically, internationally, and in disaster situations. Together, we're saving millions of lives. Thank you. Ready to find your wellness in the wilderness? Look no further than Hiking My Feelings. Through a combination of community and self-discovery, our programs are designed to give you the space and support to connect life's dots. If you're looking to figure out who you are underneath the stories you've been given and are ready to redesign the map of where you're headed with actionable steps and opportunities to dream big, we're here to walk alongside you. Whether you're a seasoned adventure enthusiast or brand new to the healing power of nature, we've got your back. Visit hikingmyfeelings.org today to download our free Trail Thoughts worksheets and learn more about Hiking My Feelings. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com You're listening to Wellness in the Wilderness with Sydney Williams. Have a question for Sydney and her guests? Join us on the show at 888-346-9141. That's 888-346-9141. Now back to the show with Sydney. Welcome back to Wellness in the Wilderness. I'm your host, Sydney Williams, and I'm here with Barry Williams, my husband, my best friend, my partner in crime, my adventure buddy for life. Aww. Aww. For you. <laughs> Before the break, we were talking about how Barry grew up feral in New England and also how he arrived at the destination of having a hip replacement surgery in his early 30s. And one thing, given that this show is called Wellness in the Wilderness, I think this is a great time to talk about your version of finding wellness in the wilderness. Talk to me a little bit about what happened once you got home, shipped back from the Carolinas after your hip surgery. How'd you get back up on your feet and get out there? Uh, well, it was actually pretty simple. It was hiking. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, at the time I was living up in uh just south of uh like north conway so up in like the really like wooded areas where there's mountains and lakes and everything's really nice so they gave me like you got to be on uh working or walking with uh crutches or a cane for x amount of weeks i think it was like four weeks or six weeks or something and then after that they're like just go ahead and do what you feel comfortable with um as much as you can physically tolerate so um, you know, there aren't a lot of gyms up in Wakefield, New Hampshire. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the the closest gym I had was a mountain and it was Copple Crown Mountain, and which uh, I took you when we were up in New England. Uh, you're the only person I've ever hiked that with. So you're welcome. But that was that was my trail of healing. Um, and it was um, what was it? It's like like four miles up or down. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not not too big. Big and enough. nobody knows about this trail. And it was just me and my dog at the time. And I'd go out every other day and just go hike this thing. And I'd, I'd do as much as I could. And it was just like beautiful views. And there's nobody there. Like nobody uses this trail. And um, it was just I'd get to the top and you'd overlook like the entire valley and just see all these trees and see absolutely nothing but trees. And it had like the one of the coolest like sitting rocks you'll ever see. And it was just a great place just to hang out and kind of get my life together. Cause you know, at the time I, I, I couldn't skydive and, um, and th uh, with my first marriage, things weren't going well there and it was just a nightmare. And that's, you know, that's what gave me the time to really kind of get out and think about, you know, what I want to be when I grow up. And shortly there after that, I actually took my wilderness uh emt course up in north conway at, at solo shout out stone hearth open learning opportunity yeah <laughs> so the oldest uh continually operating wilderness uh medicine facility in the country yeah. and probably the world so um so that was like a month-long course and um so that really kind of really kick-started my love for the wilderness and being out in nature and just like the power of it and just that time alone, um, it was just really, really good for me. 
So for people that know you today, present day, they know Barry, who is like, just chill beyond belief. Like you are like the coolest cucumber I've ever met. You're super present. You're really like grounded. Has that always been the case? Like, <laughs> or did, or did this like chapter of healing on Copple Crown kind of bring that out of you? No, I, that actually, that was the time frame where things really started changing. I started spending a lot more time outdoors and then, you know, with the relationship falling apart and kind of figuring things out. That is when I really started because of spending so much time outdoors, the ability to kind of work on myself and become the person that I am today. Yeah. The person that you would be happy to hike with (laughs) because before I'd only hike by myself, you know, and I liked it that way. And I still do to this day, you know, because it just gives me time to think and I, or, or lack thereof, to be honest with you. Um, Cause hiking for me is a meditation and it's just, it's just becoming one with the universe yeah. being out there, you know, without hearing any planes or hearing any cars or like, you know, job things and whatnot. So it's just, that's, that's my happy place. So when you were working in skydiving and you were a safety and training advisor for the United States Parachute Association at the different drop zones that you were working with, what are some of the lessons from skydiving or some of the inspiration in what we do today at Hiking My Feelings that translates from your time teaching safety, advocating for safety, and like being the face of safety in skydiving? So, I mean, I taught people to skydive for 16, 17 years, and I I wasn't doing tandems where you have, you know, somebody strapped to the front of you. I'm actually teaching a six to eight hour course, and the student has their own parachute. Three to four hours if you're Sydney Williams. Right. But for the average bear. <laughs> well, that, that that evening was superior instruction, I think. Fair. Um, so... Um, you know, it's really about details and understanding how people learn because everybody learns differently. Um, and and really going back to basics because the stuff that you teach in a first jump course is really the basics and understanding how things work. And and I think that's one of the most important things because if you don't have a good foundation, you can't really build a solid building on top of it. Um, and I think some of it is is that. And but when it pertains to uh, being outdoors and kind of transferring that skill to being outside, um, I think going back to basics is an important thing in relation to when I started back in my day. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Buckle up. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't have GPSs. Right. You're right. So I actually was downloading maps with like turn by turn, like map quest type stuff on these trails. Whereas, yeah. So it's it's like the map quest to get to the trail, but then also like walk 1.3 miles. When you get to the tree, take a left. Like, right. That's exactly, <laughs> for you what, it like. <laughs> That's exactly what it was like, you know? So, um, you know, I, I'm, I don't really want to date myself on that, but it's like, there's so much that can go wrong out there. And I think that's where the yin and yang of hiking my feelings, like you are the brilliant mind behind it. And the super excited young blood getting, <laughs> I'm I'm representing all the newbies out there and the, the transition from like, I've never done this before. Let me break in my shoes at my hiking or my standing desk Right. to yeah. now I climb Mount Whitney and I'm kind of a badass. Yeah. But like, my youthful energy as far as like my exposure to the outdoors combined with your brilliance and your safety foundation that you've been teaching like literally your entire adult life. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's my ability to see the future. Tell me more. Well, you know, like with Scott having, it got to the point where I was, I was getting really good at predicting who was going to die next. To the point where I was actually, I went up to certain individuals and be like, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to die. Yeah. Um, and I had those conversations and it's like, and obviously as a safety and training advisor is my job to kind of keep everybody safe. And for the most part, it was on the drop zone. Everybody was safe and you're checking people's gear and you're watching the winds and the weather and, you know, traffic and all sorts of stuff that goes along with that. Um, but it's very hard to invent a new way to die skydiving. Right. And it's very hard to invent a new way to die in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, you know, people think they want to be real creative, but they're not, you know, if you, if you look at the, the, the skydiving incident reports, it's all the same stuff. Yeah. It's people pushing past their limits, past their gear limits, their, uh, skill sets. And usually when we see accidents in the outdoors, it's the same thing. A lot of, they're not prepared. You don't know what you don't know. Right. Uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes. Right. People don't know what they don't know. So they have that. What was, uh, what was the what was the term that you used? Delusional confidence. Delusional confidence. Same thing. So, um, you know, it's my job to kind of was to temper them. And like, if there is an accident, deconstruct it, figure out how it happened and and how to learn from it and spread that knowledge. But I, how it relates to the outdoors, and we kind of joke every once in a while because every time we go out, me and you, or with a group, it's we kind of joke that it's the hiking my feelings, uh, search and rescue, right? Um, because it's it very rare do we go out on a trail unless it's a trail that there's nobody on. But when we see other people out there, there's usually somebody that's in trouble in one form or another, they're lost, they don't know where they're at or how they got there. Yeah, um, you got people that prepare for their hike by bringing a, a six pack of white claw shout out three sisters yeah three sisters what up san diego yep <laughs> um and you know living near three sisters we i mean the, the night before we moved out here to catalina there was they rescued what three people with a helicopter mm-hmm. so you know it's just you know the the skills are the same and when you see these things happen um it's nothing new and it's all preventable yeah that's the thing you know and and people don't know what they don't know and that's just simple education you know yeah so well when i think about the translation of skills from skydiving to outdoors especially since in my specific unique case you've been my instructor for both so what i take away from skydiving that i've applied to the outdoors is like that spatial awareness like how you would tell us how we were taught how to operate and walk around an aircraft, whether the props were spinning or not, gave me like a foundation to look around and like be aware of the space that I'm occupying on the trail and like just paying attention to more stuff. And I think one of the best things that came out of skydiving as far as our programming for Hiking My Feelings is how you've taken what you used to do in skydiving and applied it to the outdoors through your safety and training meetings as a function of Blaze Your Own Trail to Self-Love. Do you want to talk a little bit about the adventure planner sheet, where that came from and how that was inspired by skydiving and how that translates to outdoor preparedness? Absolutely. Fantastic. Let's go. Okay. (laughs) Um, So uh, at least from the skydiving perspective, a lot of the training and procedures and stuff comes from the aviation industry. Like we literally, you know, when you walk through a gear check to check your parachute, You know, you check it three times and you do it in a systematic order. You do it the same way every time. And that's really about creating a repetition so you don't miss anything. Um, And just you're just getting good habits. Um, So what I did with the uh, planning sheet is I took like a logbook entry for like a pilot um, and really kind of just kind of swapped it over to um, an outdoor trip. So whether it's a day trip or a a multi-leg backpacking trip, you know, you have all the details like, all right, what time does the sun come up? What time does the sun set? Uh, What's the weather? How many hours of, how many uh, hours in the day do I have to actually complete? What's the elevation change? What, you know, so you can actually really kind of put the nuts and bolts of it. Like, all right, I, I know that I walk X amount of miles in a certain amount of time. And this trail is this many miles. So I should have, you know, it's approximately going to take me about, you know, let's say five hours or whatever. So I should have plenty of daylight and, and, you know, just coming up with a list of all the gear, um, what kind of footwear, um, you know, leaving your contact information to, for other people. So they know where you're going and you you can actually hand them that and like, Hey, I'm hiking this trail. This is the route I'm going to go. So, you know, if I don't have a Garmin or uh, something to do SOS with, or because I'm going to be out of uh, cell phone range, this is where I'm at. So I'm not really inventing anything new. I'm just applying it to the outdoors. Yeah. And I love that. And I think too, um, if we think about how 
I learned how to skydive and then how you helped me prepare or frankly, how you helped me not prepare (laughs) for my first backpacking trip. Um, Talk to me a little bit about like the difference. I kind of feel like you had an opportunity, like if you were anybody else, you could have helicopter parented me on this backpacking trip. You could have mansplained how the outdoors works, but you let me figure it out enough for myself to where I didn't put myself in jeopardy, but I also learned some lessons. What were some of the things that I packed that you giggled about or some of the actions I was taking to prepare for my first trip on the Trans Catalina Trail back in 2016 that maybe you wouldn't recommend other people follow? I, I understand that everybody learns differently, but I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I think for me personally, I need to do things. And just because I think it's the right way to do it may not be the right way, but it usually is. I'm j- I'll just say that. But yeah, Barry's always right in case right. you haven't figured it out. Um, but I think one of the best educational tools is pain. And now I'm not, I'm certainly not going to let anybody get into a situation where it's going to be dangerous or they're going to get hurt terribly bad uh, in your case. Uh, but yeah, when you were standing at your standing desk and wearing your hiking boots and I'm kind of like, what are you doing? I'm breaking in my hiking boots. No, you're not. <laughs> I just kind of walked out and then you brought your tarot cards and you brought like six changes of clothes. I was ready for the fashion police to show up with the Rangers. Right. And um, so I let you roll with it. How'd that work out for me? I, you tell me. Pretty good, I'd say. <laughs> I mean, like, did you learn? I, and I Was did. it education? It was. Okay. And well, uh, through a lot of things. So Barry's 11 years older than me. And in a lot of ways, I'm like, I turned to Barry and I'm like, So uh, when you were my age, where were you at? And I think a lot of things that are passed on to me, like I learn a lot through observing how you work and how you move through the world. But sometimes like I, I, while I would have appreciated maybe like a pro tip about the shoes and not just like, no, you're not. And then an exit. uh, I, I am grateful for that opportunity because now I found shoes that I absolutely love. I've got it dialed in to my feet specifically and life is good. Um, so yeah, well, cool. So we moved to Catalina. Yeah, we yeah. did. We moved here January 9th. Today is January 31st. So we've been here for almost a month and we've been kind of teasing that we're like doing some cool stuff. So before we go to the break in a couple words, like, how's it been? Do you like it here? Love it here. What's your favorite thing so far? Oof. You can break it up into categories if you need to. Yeah. Well, I mean, the wildlife is amazing. Yeah. The weather's been barring the rain that we've had has been awesome. Yeah. Um, and I'm really starting to get used to the people. Yep. Cause they're interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the interesting things we've seen. So what we're doing. So we got a big announcement coming up in this next segment. If you're listening and you want to call in and say, Hey, or share what you're grateful for, give us a call at 888-346-9141. When we get back, we've got a big announcement. And just because Barry's here doesn't mean that we're having babies. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel that S guess that you might be making. No babies for Sydney and Barry. It's a different announcement. And we'll share a little bit more about what we've got going on in Catalina Island when we get back after the break. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Yeah. Ready to find your wellness in the wilderness? Look no further than Hiking My Feelings. Through a combination of community and self-discovery, our programs are designed to give you the space and support to connect life's dots. If you're looking to figure out who you are underneath the stories you've been given and are ready to redesign the map of where you're headed with actionable steps and opportunities to dream big, we're here to walk alongside you. Whether you're a seasoned adventure enthusiast or brand new to the healing power of nature, we've got your back. Visit hikingmyfeelings.org today to download our free Trail Thoughts worksheets and learn more about Hiking My Feelings. Sawyer is more than an outdoor company. Every Sawyer product you buy contributes to our common humanity, bringing Sawyer water filtration systems to people in need all around the world. In just 2022 alone, 260,000 households in over 45 countries received clean drinking water through Sawyer filters. Over the past 10 years, we've teamed up with over 140 charities in 80 countries 
to provide long-term, sustainable relief, domestically, internationally, and in disaster situations. Together, we're saving millions of lives. Thank you. Have you ever spoken unkindly to yourself? Do you realize when you do? Are you ready to make changes, but find yourself completely paralyzed by the choices in front of you? We live in a hyper-connected, always-on world, and frankly, it's exhausting. Let's make time to disconnect from the distractions and reconnect with yourself. Hiking My Feelings exists to help people discover the healing power of nature. Kickstart your healing journey and grab a copy of the book that started our movement, Hiking My Feelings, Stepping into the Healing Power of Nature. Named one of Audible's best hiking audiobooks and available wherever books are sold. Visit hikingmyfeelings.org today to learn more. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com You're listening to Wellness in the Wilderness with Sydney Williams. Have a question for Sydney and her guests? Join us on the show at 888-346-9141. That's 888-346-9141. Now back to the show with Sydney. All right, everybody, welcome back to Wellness in the Wilderness. I'm Sydney Myers. <laughs> this is hard with Barry in the room, but I love it because uh, he gives me these looks like you're cute, and I usually listen to this from far away. Um, so before the break, we were talking about uh, how we've been translating Barry's skills from skydiving into the outdoors, not reinventing the wheel, just making what we already know applicable. And speaking a, a a new but not foreign language, and we before the break we were talking about the planning sheet that we have. We talked about how we moved to Catalina Island. Barry's loving the wildlife. He's loving the people that we're seeing and meeting here. And so announcement time. Before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what hiking my feelings is doing on Catalina Island. So over the years we have like this, it's kind of wild to think about. So I talked to you a little bit about this in my solo episode, um, episode four, where I just kind of like gave the history of our experiences on Catalina Island. And if I think back to where we were in 2016, where we were in 2018, when I got off this trail, like the first contact that I made when I got back to cell reception in two harbors after our trip in 2018 was to the Catalina Island Conservancy. And I was like, listen, we this trail is just spectacular. And unless y'all are trying to keep it a secret, I'd love to do my part and help bring awareness to this trail, help protect this trail, conserve it for future generations. So more people can have the same experiences that I've had. And if I'm lucky enough, I'd love to facilitate the same kind of conditions that I had for my backpacking trips, which with Barry was a good solid foundation, non-judgment, a whole lot of fun and some healing had along the way. So as far as what hiking my feelings is doing here, this is kind of, we've like in the years since we started hiking my feelings and leading up to this, we've traveled around the country two, three times talking about the trans Catalina trail, how much it's changed my life, how much I love it. Um, all the incredible experiences that we've had here, um, through my speaking tour with the different REI stores in 2019, 60 different REI stores and 70 something hikes talking about the healing power of nature, specifically on Catalina Island. And we wrote, the, I, well, we wrote the book. I wrote the book. So like this island has been a huge part of what we've been doing. And that introduction to REI for that tour came from the Conservancy. So we've been out here just kind of like slinging the good word about Catalina Island and all things recreation out here. And now that we're here, it's kind of a nice pause for us in that over the last four and a half years, we've been building out some really incredible programs between our Blaze Your Own Trail to Self-Love program, which we've got another class coming up starting in March. So stay tuned for more information about that. Um, our retreats that are based on the modules within Blaze Your Own Trail to Self-Love, three of which that we've hosted here. And we've got another big one that we're cooking up for later this fall. More information on that coming soon as well. But so for us at Hiking My Feelings, now that we have a home base, I mean, we've been going around the country. We've done like three laps around the U.S. And we and every single time people are like, well, this is awesome. But now you're leaving. Like, where do we go? And at the time we thought, oh, well, maybe we should build a retreat center. And then we realized like what a heavy lift that was financially and kind of put that on the back burner. And then we thought about, oh, well, maybe we should do hiking chapters. And like there's somebody in Seattle who hosts like Hiking My Feelings hikes and like all these different like areas around the country. But now that we're here, we're like, 
well, shoot, we've been telling everybody how good the Trans Catalina Trail is. Why don't we just kind of hang out here, run the programs that we already have in existence and start to like really set a foundation for Hiking My Feelings on the island and how we can start to build relationships with other organizations, other businesses on the island, how we can bring more people here, how we can make hiking and backpacking on the Trans Catalina Trail more accessible. Like what are the things that Hiking My Feelings can do to facilitate this experience for other people? So in the absence of going on a tour, which in the grand scheme of all things Hiking My Feelings, like Barry is the one that coordinates the trips. He's the one that plans the routes. He's the one that does the driving. He's the one that picks the hikes. He's the one that picks the backpacking trips. Like Barry does so much for this organization. And now that we're not going on some massive tour, like we do still have some retreats in Sequoia this summer that we're excited to open up registration for soon. But with all this extra time that isn't being poured into driving around the country and coordinating a nationwide tour, we have some time to like support another business on the island. So big announcement. You want to do a drum roll? Let's do a drum roll. So we are happy to share that we were invited by Cindy McGugan Cassidy to join the team at Catalina Backcountry as her new partners, boots on the ground, the friendly faces that you'll see when you come to the island and you utilize Catalina Backcountry services. So Barry, do you want to talk a little bit about what we've been up to and some of the stuff that we've got looking future forward as far as what we're doing with Backcountry? Yeah. So uh, Backcountry are the people that support us when we do our retreats across the island so they do like gear hauls they do catering they set up tents um and they also now we we lead hikes yeah so we're doing uh you know all the things that we enjoy doing but we're actually able to share this island with people that are coming out here to enjoy it yeah so we are leading some short day hikes uh in and around avalon we're doing some stuff at the airport uh, we go down into Little Harbor from the airport. We, you know, we we tell people where all the cookies are at and all the good places to get seafood. Um, and we would, you know, just supporting people that want to hike this trail by, you know, either hauling gear or setting up tents or you, you may even get some 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 cooking from a award winning chef. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think it's it's a really cool opportunity. One. Um, for us to support Cindy in this, and this is a business that she bought. Um, it was already in, uh, in business on the Island when she was here. And then the founders of that Catalina back country kind of took a back seat or took a back step from the business. And the history of it is just really cool. And Cindy's vision and her reason for picking up the business and what she wants to do with it and how this kind of ties into how she's giving back to the Island as well. Um, is really inspiring and I got to get Cindy on the show. So first of all, Cindy, if you're listening, tell me a day that you're free and we'll chat about the history of Catalina backcountry. But I think on a bigger scale, like one of the things, what this opportunity gives us a couple of different things that we can work with. One, the thing that I like most about it is these are folks that are already traveling to the island, so they don't need to be convinced here to, to come here. So they're looking to have an adventure. They find Catalina Backcountry. They're coming. They're ready to go versus us doing a retreat and all of our programming and really digging into like the mental health aspects and the wellness aspects of spending time outside. We're literally just showing people all the really cool stuff on this island. And I think it's a cool opportunity to enjoy the outdoors, share the wonder that is Catalina Island without it having to be a hiking my feelings thing. And I think that that's really cool to have like a little bit of separation from that, where it can be like just straight up outdoorsy fun and or come for the full Hiking My Feelings program. Thoughts on that? I just, what immediately came to mind is at the end of office space where they're at the end and uh, they're like, yep, getting outside, getting some exercise, you know, life's pretty good. I think he throws a few expletives in there, but you know, it's it's uh it's it's great to be out here and just like see these bison and they're just so majestic and these Catalina Island fox and it's just it's be, it's great to be out here. Yeah, absolutely great. Yeah, so as a function of uh what we've been doing to get ramped up for some of the guided hikes and tours that we're offering, um, the first hike that we did after we moved here was on the original first section of the Trans Catalina Trail, and it was awesome. Mm-hmm. The east end of the island is so, so cool. 
what are your thoughts on some of these other sections and how, like for folks that aren't ready to backpack, that might be listening. They're like, what's this TCT all about? Like, how do I get on here? What can I look forward to? What are some of the things that you're most excited about from an accessibility standpoint? Like you don't have to do the whole TCT. What are some of the things that you're excited about from a, like a introduction to the TCT perspective? Well, that's, that's what we've been doing since we got here. We're just kind of scouting all these kind of local trails out of Avalon. So if you're like a, a on a cruise ship or something, or you just, you know, you're spending time in Avalon because that's where everybody is. That's where the hotels are for the most part. I mean, there's two harbors, but predominantly Avalon, but like some of these trails that we're, we're on, we were just talking about it yesterday that in all reality, you could probably take a wheelchair out there. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're even if they're dirt, like there's some of the trails that we're gonna, we're gonna do hikes on that are are paved that have these stunning views, and there's some elevation. But if if you think you can push somebody up there in a wheelchair, you could you could do it even on the dirt stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's a you know, so we're we're gonna have everything from like um, I think uh, the one hour hike is like two point two miles or yeah, something. something like that. Small little quick. You know, few hour uh, excursion all the way up to you know fourteen miles just out of the city of Avalon, and you know we can take people to the uh, Wrigley Memorial and the Botanic Garden. We can take them down Hermit Gulch, so you can actually see the part of the trans the, the, the new Trans Catalina Trail. So we're, you get we got options, yeah, and it's just nice to explore them all because uh, I mean, there's uh, how many miles? Of trail, two hundred and eighty, one hundred sixty-five miles of like trail, trail, right. and then with roads and stuff, I think it comes up to like two something. Right. So I'm just excited to get out and experience them all. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So uh, George the Bison. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Yeah. I, I've been called a lot of things, but Bison is not one of them. Yeah. So what? what so you. Try- Trying to do this metaphor about a a, a, a bison with a gimpy leg. Well, that's so, me. well, no, you're the one that brought up that George has a gimpy <laughs> leg. So every week when I write the wellness in the wilderness newsletter, I pick like there's a section that's like a note from Sydney um, as if I'm not always the one that's always writing the emails. It's cute how I do that in third person sometimes. But anyway, I pick a photo and then I kind of like it's either I come there with something to say or like I pick a photo and then write to the photo. And this week I was writing to the photo. Um And so we had this moment where I was sitting there and like the picture of the bison is George. And he's like almost to the top of this hill. And my first reflection was, okay, if we look at a photo or if we walk by someone in the context of this photo of this bison, we might look at it and be like, oh, look, he's so close to the top. Because I think like, or maybe this is just me. I could be projecting the way I think onto like a generic statement about all humans. But I think like in general, especially in America and especially in my lived experience, we have this like finish line mentality. Like we got to get to this thing. And then after that is the next thing. And so if we're looking at this picture of this bison, like he's not to the top yet. So we might be like, oh, he's almost there. But that single snapshot and or like your only interaction with somebody or you're walking past someone, like we don't see where they came from to get to that moment. And we don't know where they're going after. So in the context of this photo of George, it's like, he's almost there, but we like, there's no space to be held and no conversation being had about how he walked through and up these canyons to get to this ridge and like the canyon that he'll descend down to. And so like the metaphor was pretty clunky. And I was trying to think of like how that could translate. And I don't have it yet clearly because I'm still stumbling on it, but the exercise that came out of it, if we're thinking about like things that can help you get back into your body and inspire a wilderness memory without even having to be there, like a tip for how to find your wellness in the wilderness this week that I would offer is to pick a photo and I'll use the picture of George as an example, but like when you come to Catalina Island and the first time you see a bison, it might be the only time you see a bison. Chances are you're here for a weekend or you're here on a cruise, or maybe you're doing the TCT and that's the first and only bison you see. But there's that level of like joy and excitement, like, oh my God, I saw a bison. And then the next level is like, think about what that would be like to see that bison with some regularity. Like now you work here or you live here and you see it and it's really cool. Um, And then thinking about what that bison's life might be like and just kind of putting yourself into it. And the point I'm trying to make is I was stumbling on this metaphor and then I like went through this like visualization exercise looking at this photo. And then I was like, oh, well that in and of itself kind of calmed my nerves a little bit. So maybe it's as simple as looking at a photo and imagining what that animal's life is like. Do you have a tip? 
for to help people find wellness in their wilderness? Yeah, I think one of my favorite tips, I can't remember who said it, but the only Zen you'll find in a mountaintop is the Zen you bring up there. However, I find that spending time outdoors lets you find your Zen. That when you get up to that mountaintop, you're going to be able to enjoy it a little bit more. So. so it's kind of like they've worked together. Yeah, well, I was reading an article in Psychology Today that was like, the more effort you put into it, the more uh, joy you find in it. Mm. So I was a little bit mixed on it because, you know, the best views come at the top of the tallest mountains. However, the only piece you'll find up there is the piece you bring with you. So, hey, yeah. so any other news? Any other things we want to share? Oh, I'm 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 getting really good at pinpointing the people that are uh, that I read about in the sheriff's log at the Islander, uh, the Catalina Islander. I can actually uh, try. I know who they are. I have I, I a pretty good idea who they are. So I know where the bison live. I have the bison named. And I also know where the interesting cats live on the island. All right. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yep. Okay. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Any final words of wisdom? It's been a pleasure and an honor to be on the show with you, Mrs. Williams. Oh, Mr. Williams, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Wellness in the Wilderness. Uh, so thank you for joining us for this week's dose of Wellness in the Wilderness. I sincerely hope that today's conversation was a breath of fresh air. And I look forward to connecting with you again next Tuesday at one o'clock Pacific on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Until next time, take good care of yourself. Take good care of each other. Dream big and be kind. We'll see you next week. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on this week's show. We hope this episode has been a breath of fresh air for you and has inspired you to find your wellness in the wilderness. We will reconnect with nature and you again next week. Since 1984, Sawyer has existed to support your wildest adventures. Learn about their advanced insect repellents and family of technical lightweight water filters at Sawyer.com.